to together today with prayers, scriptures, a message, and songs. So welcome to each one of you who gather here together. The sermon title today is, If I Keep My Eyes on Jesus. It's not, I will keep my eyes on Jesus. It's not, when I keep my eyes on Jesus, or why I keep my eyes on Jesus. It's if, that big if that often steps into our lives. Michael, I'm sure, will delve into the deeper ifs. But I'd like to share a few thoughts. You may think you've figured out how to keep your eyes on him. But for me, this is not easy. That if is always in my mind for many reasons. If I keep my eyes on Jesus, what happens? Maybe it is a warning sign for me. What happens if I fail to keep my eyes on him? Or, or is it a must do so I can keep peace in my life? If I focus on him and his words, will it help me control my reactions to the inevitable storms of life? Would keeping my eyes on him bring me any strength? Maybe if my focus is on Jesus, I automatically take the focus off my problems. <laughs> In life, we will each meet storms and setbacks. And these life storms always have a way of bringing out what is in you and in me, fear, or faith. It's easy to wallow in self-pity first, rather than meet with Jesus in prayer, in worship. He is our anchor. Although this is difficult to do, when I feel down, worried, or discouraged by what life throws at me, I try, and that's a big word, I try to break out of that cycle by focusing on others rather than self. Just as Jesus taught us when he focused on the lost, the broken, and the hurting. Michael's scripture text refers to the calming of the sea and calling Peter to walk out on the water. If Jesus called you out on that same water, out of the boat, would your eyes be fixated on him or on the situation you found yourself in? Even if you substitute the wind and the waves for life's struggles and trials, the idea still remains that if you focus on him, the anchor, he is in control and will at the very least bring comfort reassurance in the midst of life's storms. The ability to keep our eyes on him and trust in him during difficult times will determine whether we walk in his peace or we allow every worry and fear to dominate our thinking. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, throughout each day, encourage us to fix our eyes on you, the peace giver and our anchor. Work in each of us to turn our attention to you directly and help us to put our confidence and faith in you. Amen. stand and sing with me as we praise our God.
gladness when the Lord has rescued Israel. Now we have an opportunity to share our resources as the ushers come forward. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, may the offerings given today be blessed by you to be used near and far for your kingdom work. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn in them to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. The passage that we're reading together this morning is going to seem familiar because we read its parallel in the Gospel of Mark, but this is a slightly different version. If you think about it, the four Gospels are kind of like facets of a single gem, and so they all tell us about the life and the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, but as you turn the different facets, you get a slightly different angle on what's going on. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. These are words from God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. God, we thank you for these moments to gather together around the scriptures. And we pray that in these moments, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we pray that the outcome of these moments would not just be that we gain more information about what the scripture says, but God, we invite you to do in us a work of transformation so that more and more in who we are and in how we live, the life of Jesus would be evident. And so we pray in his name. Amen. So I'm wondering, the passage that we're talking about this morning talks about boats and being on a boat. What is the biggest boat that you've ever been on? 
Anybody? A cruise ship, okay. Yes, cruise ships are giant boats the size of small cities. Anybody else like a really big boat that you've been on? A freighter. You've been on a freighter, okay. Freighters are huge ships as well, okay. What is the smallest boat that you've ever been in? Canoe. Canoe. A canoe, okay, okay. Like a kayak, right? Right? A real small sailboat. A real small sailboat, okay, okay. So boats come in all different sizes. They come in all different types. Uh, obviously, there are boats that are known in our world that were not known in the time of Jesus, but there were freighters in the time of Jesus, and there were small boats, and the boats that he used to traverse back and forth across the Sea of Galilee were usually fishing boats. They were usually boats that had another purpose, that had a commercial boat purpose, but Jesus was using them for transportation, and Jesus was using them in a deliberate strategy so that people would not always know exactly where Jesus was, but he could move about in the region, and he could minister in different places by traveling on the boat. Now, we know last time that he had tried to get, when we looked at a similar passage last week, we knew that he was trying to go away with his disciples for a time of rest, but that didn't really work because a whole bunch of people followed him, and he began to teach them, and then he healed the ones who were sick. He cast out demons, and then he fed them all with five loaves and two fish. And then, that's where our passage picks up this morning. Jesus is telling his disciples to go on ahead of him in the boat across the lake, and he's going to send the crowd away, so he dismisses the crowd, and then Jesus stays there. As a matter of fact, Jesus climbs a mountain in that region, and he does what he does so many times. He prays all night long. This was one of the things that was an anchor for Jesus' life, were these times of extended prayer. And I encourage you, if you've never done that before, uh, it's worth losing a night of sleep just to see how deep can go in your fellowship with God if you'll stay up all night and pray. Uh, a lot of you know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night and pray because the things that are pressing down on your heart are so creating anxiety, they're causing you to be afraid, and so they take your sleep away and you find yourself in the middle of the night praying because of your circumstances, because of what's going on in your life because of that person who's going astray, because of that person who's sick, because of that person who's having a mental health challenge, you realize that they need your intercession, they need your prayers, and so you find yourself there in the middle of the night praying. So when Jesus was finished praying, it's early in the morning, and he sees the disciples, and they're a long way from shore, and they're not getting... Uh, far because the wind is against them and so the text that we're reading the, together this morning says that he went out to them in the early morning walking on the lake. The point of this passage is that Jesus has mastery, Jesus has control over the created order, over the created world. If you were to ask what is the purpose of this passage, why is this passage in the scripture, that's the point of it, that Jesus is in control of the natural order, that Jesus is in control of created things. He's already demonstrated that in the passage before by feeding those thousands and thousands of people with those five loaves and those two fish that he was able to make sufficient for all of them to the point that the disciples each picked up a basket of broken pieces. But now he's showing that he has dominion over the created order by walking out to the disciples on the lake. Now when they see him, they have a reaction to him. And the reaction is maybe different than you or I would think that we would react. We would hope that we would react to seeing Jesus walking on the water. Like, hey, that's Jesus. This is great. Come on in the boat. You know. Maybe things will get better, but, but they cry out in fear 
because they think he's a ghost. Now, that's kind of strange, right? Because if you see somebody walking on the water, that's an, that's an unusual occurrence. That's not something that happens all the time. But you would think that their first thought wouldn't be that he was a ghost. So maybe what's happening is that these fishermen, these people who have known how to swim before they could walk, they just totally don't know what to do with this phenomenon that's happening to them then. And so they cry out in fear. They're terrified by what's going on. And so they think that Jesus is a ghost. And, and the scripture says they just cry out in fear. There are different things in our lives that make us afraid. There are different things in our lives that create anxiety for us. I don't know what the things are that create anxiety in your life. But I know that they're there. There are things that just sees us with concern for the future. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to take place. And so we have that reaction of anxiety. And we might even get to the point where we cry out in fear, where we don't know what to say, but we're just terrified about what we're afraid might happen. And so in that moment, Jesus' disciples cry out in fear, and he says to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. We talked about that a lot last week. But then the strange things happen, the strange thing happens that's not in the Gospel of Mark that we looked at. The strange thing happens where Peter has this question for Jesus. He says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now that's interesting. Peter doesn't say, Lord, since it's you. He doesn't say, Lord, it's you. Tell me to come to you on the water. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter is not sold on the fact that this is Jesus. Peter still doesn't understand what's going on. Peter still doesn't understand the circumstances. So he decides to design some kind of a test to see if this really is Jesus, even though Jesus has already said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. That's not enough for Peter. Peter is skeptical. We don't often think of G Peter as being the skeptical apostle. We think of Thomas as being the one who needs to see proof, who needs to be able to touch Jesus' body. But in this circumstance, in this event, it's Peter who's skeptical. And he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, Jesus could have responded in a lot of different ways to Peter. He could have said to Peter, why do you doubt that it's me? Don't you know that it's me? Accept my word. Take courage. Don't be afraid. It's me. But instead, Jesus just speaks this one word. He says, come. There are times when we come to God and we come to God from a place of doubt rather than a place of faith. And we come to God and we say, Lord, I don't know what you can do in this circumstance. I don't know what you can do in this person's life. I, I, it's all beyond me, Lord. I don't know what good can come out of this. And we pray something like, Lord, if you can do anything, help. Help. And we trust God even in the midst of our doubts, even in the midst of our uncertainties, even in the midst of all that we don't know. We just cry out to God. And it's in a moment like that where Peter doesn't even completely believe that this is Jesus, but he says, Lord, if it's you, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus just speaks that one word. He says, come. And that's enough in that moment for Peter. Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on the water and come to Jesus. Wow. 
I mean, what a moment, right? What a life-transforming moment. You have spent your entire life around water and boats. You know how this works. You know that people don't walk on water. You know that, Peter, that people sink in water. But there he is. He's out of the boat, and he's walking toward Jesus. What a transformative experience. But then something happens that changes everything. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. In that moment, Peter stopped looking at Jesus. And he started looking at the wind. And he was terrified all over again. And he began to do what people do when they're out on the water. They sink. And in that moment of sinking, he cries out to Jesus. He says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out his hand and catches him. This is not the point of this scripture. But it's a point that you and I need to take home into our lives. We need to spend our time looking not at our circumstances, not at the wind and the waves that are all around us, but we need to spend our time looking at Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because if we look at our circumstances, if we look at the wind and the waves all around us, we are going to sink down into our anxiety. We are going to sink down into our fear. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, He is in the business of rescuing us. Not all at once, maybe not even across the course of many months, but Jesus in, is in the business of rescuing us and others when we cry out to Him. The gospel doesn't always promise us that things are going to turn out all right. We can pray as much as we are able and things will go from worse to even more difficult. But when we pray, we're doing the right thing. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we are doing the right thing. He doesn't want you to look at the wind and the waves. He doesn't want you to look at the things that are creating anxiety for you. He wants you to trust Him with those things and to keep your eyes fixed on Him. The writer of the book of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we won't lose heart. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will maintain our ability to trust Him with our circumstances. There is something in your life this morning that you are anxious about. There is something in your life this morning that you are waking up in the middle of the night thinking about. And it feels sometimes like you're drowning. But Jesus says, take my hand, trust me, and I'll pull you out of those waters. Amen.
that stand.
So I did a strange thing this morning that I don't usually do. I said that the point of the sermon was not the point of the passage. Did anybody catch that? Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of strange. I don't usually do that. Usually the point of the passage is the point of the sermon. Um, so just for you to go home with this and to reflect on this, the point of the passage we talked about is that Jesus has control over the created order. We don't always think about that. We think about Jesus healing. We think about Jesus casting out demons. We think about teaching. But we don't always think about Jesus having control over the created order. The punchline, if you will, for the whole passage is there in the last sentence when they, when they climbed into the boat, when Peter and Jesus climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. So we worship Jesus because, in part, because he has control over the created order. He has control over the world that he made. Jesus is the agent of God's creative activity, and he has control over the created world. So... In case you're wondering what the point of the passage is. Now is the point in the service when if you have a comment about the sermon, uh, if you have a prayer request, if you have an announcement, you can share that. And if you just say your name as you share it. Oh boy. That's interesting. That never happens. All right. So there's some folks that we do want to be praying for. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Glenn High. We want to continue uh, to pray for Cindy. Uh, Cindy had some good news this week. She's more pain-free than she has been, so we're excited about that. Um, we want to uh, keep praying for the march for a ceasefire. Uh, they are in Washington, D.C. today, and Ben is there in Washington, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I know Friday they were in the suburbs, mm -hmm. um, and when they were 26 miles from the capital, they stopped and prayed because 26 miles is the length of Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, I know Ben joined them yesterday morning. Um, and I know that Tuesday is when they will do their peaceful protest. Um, but other than that, I just know what I read from the blogs. I know that there is a petition that they are looking for signatures and hoping to have 100,000 signatures by um, Tuesday. If you would like the link to be able to sign that petition, you can ask me and I can send it to you. Okay. Yeah, or you can just, yeah, or you can just, yeah, just send that out. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, this is your way to be involved in this protest. Um, you can always Google Mennonite Action and find out what they are working on. Um, but this is a way for us to be involved in saying that we want an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and we want the United States to stop underwriting this war with your tax dollars, with munitions that are made here in the United States. Um, and just a point of interest, the second night they um, spent in Luray, or Luray, uh -huh. uh, Virginia, and um, Monday I emailed Kathy and Ken to see if they had had any connection, and they said that they had provided ice cream, but they hadn't they hadn't gone to the church that night. And maybe if they'd known that Ben was going to be there, they would have. But Ben said that, yeah, it was good ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a word? Okay. Uh, we want to pray for Camp Middleland staff and campers. Are you working this week, Emily? No, I worked last week. Um, I was not last yeah. week officially working, but I'll probably show up there at some point this week. Um, so last week was the last uh, week of overnight camp, so 
Kids Sleeping Over is finished, um, that part of the ministry, but there's three more weeks of day camp. Um, okay. And so especially prayers for health of counselors, they've been struggling a little bit with like head colds or song bugs kind of going around. So. Okay. Yeah, so we want to pray for the campers that are there. I want to pray for the staff, particularly that they would stay well. So let's pray together. God, we thank you that your heart is open, that your ears are attentive to our cry. Lord, we thank you that when our heart says, save me, Lord, your hand stretches out to touch us, to save us from the wind and the waves around us. God, we pray for Glenn that you would continue to strengthen him through the process of rehab. God, we pray for Cindy for the rehab that she's experiencing, that it would be effective. God, we thank you for this uh, injection that she's been able to have that takes away a lot of the pain that she was experiencing. God, we pray for the people that are marching to the Capitol for the protest actions that are going to be taking place in these next few days. God, we pray that you would soften the hearts of people in power, legislators, people in the executive branch, that you would help them to see that the way forward is not the way of more violence, but rather is the way of peace. And so we do pray for a ceasefire in Gaza. God, we pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray for that to come to an end. God, we pray for all the places in our world where there is civil war and domestic unrest. We pray for the nation of Haiti, for all the turmoil that is going on there. God, we pray for Camp Meadowland. We pray for the campers and the counselors there. We pray for these last three weeks of day camp. That those would be transformative experiences for the kids that participate in them and for the counselors as well, God. Lord, we know that you are able to do more than we ask, more than we know how to imagine. And so we trust these needs to you. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. He's 
So go from this place to stretch out your hands toward Jesus. Go from this place to live not in your own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go from this place in love to serve the Lord.